All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to PDP Presents, Alex Cohen and Sherry Maracle. Uh, my name is Mike Ragusa. We haven't done an event in a little while, so it's really cool to see everyone here again. And just bear with us as we get things rolling. If you're new to Philly Drum Project, we are a 501c3 nonprofit under the umbrella of Culture Trust out of Philadelphia. And that just allows us to be a fully fledged nonprofit, take donations and let you get your donations tax deductible as well. And our primary goal here is to share three different resources, beats, knowledge, and gear. Um, each of which has its own like little sub uh, subcommittees that deal with our different organizational needs for those. So beats are just hanging out, uh, listening to drummers, events like these. We do beats, brews, and banters as well when we have everything in full swing outside of uh, the last couple of years, which have made things a little bit tricky for us. And knowledge is again, stuff like this. We also run educational programs when the climate is a little easier to do so. But in the meantime, we've been just trying to keep up with having regular drum clinics online and having different guests and just sharing the love for the instrument and the knowledge that we all have so we can all grow and get better together. And then gear, we do refurbishing on old drum sets and we'll send them out to different community centers and other places of need. That way we can try to just spread um, the availability of drumming in our area and make sure that people can have access to the instrument since it's not the easiest thing to always have. And uh, schools, music programs haven't always kept up as well as we'd prefer in the last few years, especially. Uh, so it's nice to try to, to help keep that going. All right, a little bit about Alex and Sherry. We're gonna have them come on in a couple of minutes here and they're gonna be sharing their own unique approaches to the drums and their own backgrounds. They're very varying um, approaches to the drums and it'll be pretty cool to see what both of them have to say. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, Alex is a writer for Drumhead Magazine. He has his own book out called Ultimate Progressive Drumming. Um, he's worked with artists such as Mac Miller in the past and so that's a, a long list. I don't wanna go through all of it, but I'm sure he can talk a little bit about it. And he's also got another book coming out later, uh, which he'll talk about a little bit as well. And Sherry is uh, more on the like jazz orchestral side of things. She's got the jazz diva, uh, or the jazz diva orchestral project that she has running on her, on her end. She's got a bunch of other projects as well that she can allude to a little bit more. And she's worked with quite a long list of names as well, but I'm not gonna go too far into everything. Um, anyway, let's see. Alex and Sherry, are you guys there? I'm gonna unmute you guys. We're here. Hi, everybody. All right, let me find you in here. Get you spotlighted. I am unmuted. There we go. Hey guys, good to have you here. Thanks. Glad to be here. Great to be yeah. here. So I'm just gonna let you guys go off with it, and the floor is yours. Um, is there anything you want to start off with specifically? Just when do you want to start? What do you want to start with, Alex? Or... <clears throat> I, uh, well, first of all, because part of my teaching and just general philosophy is that you must learn jazz as a, because it's uh, important in the art of drumming and development of the drum set. So I think Sherry 
should start with her concepts because they are the foundations of drumming and she has been fortunate enough to have been around the forefathers and the greats of the instrument so i again always learn oh i i personally always learn a lot hearing her talk okay thanks Alex. sounds good does anybody uh i know everybody's uh only a couple people are are visible on the screen but uh maybe with a thumbs up does anybody like jazz <laughs> oh cool and it'd be nice to uh you know be able to see everyone a little and hopefully everyone's got their um you know you're at a kit or a pad or something and um i have uh just a give you a, a small other hunk of background. I do have a band called the Diva Jazz Orchestra. Uh, we're just about to, next. Uh, actually on Wednesday, we're celebrating our 29th anniversary. Uh, standard big band rooted deeply in the tradition of the Buddy Rich Band. And if anybody's ever heard heard Buddy or heard of, of Buddy and his style of playing, that and Woody Herman Band. And um, I do play in a symphony orchestra in New York called the New York Pops, you know, and, and sub on Broadway and like Alex have a diverse background of musical experiences and ways I've made uh, living playing the drums. I teach at the University of the Arts right now in Philly and uh, I'm going to start out with some uh, some of some basic jazz ideas. One of the things that um, I think is a hard concept is to get a deeply rooted swing feel uh, in all of your limbs but people say oh yeah I know what jazz is and then they think of a dotted eighth and sixteenth note and sort of approach it as um, I'm not saying any of you do this, of course, but as a simplistic beat. And a lot of times stuff that we play, the groove on a sheet of paper is is very simple and we can execute it pretty well, but we don't make it feel very good. So that's one of the things I'm going to discuss with everybody today. A little bit trying to get the, get a, get a, you know, what I consider to be a very good feel, which is legato, all based and subdivided in eighth note triplets and making all the beats flow together very, very smoothly. So let me show you a couple of hand exercises. You may have done this. Some of them are, are really, really, really standard, but one that I like to do is uh, it's just right, left, left, right, left, left, and then right, right, left, right, right, left. And we'll reverse it again and, and start with our left hand phrasing wise. But a lot of times, especially when young people sit down at the drum set and start to play jazz and play triplets, they do, they're doing a lot of single strokes. Double strokes swing harder but there's no question about it double, double strokes always swing harder so using that as a legato technique on your playing to make the phrase flow when you're playing triplets is helpful so let me spin this camera around and i'll show you what i mean and we'll do this together we can do this together awesome i find my excited hopefully, to hear it hopefully this is the right <laughs> the, there it is there we go all right, all right. so we'll go to a nice uh, moderate <laughs> moderate speed but you know every time i hear you know somebody play you know I think of you ain't nothing but a hound dog right out of the bat. So, and a lot of times, and I'm not a, I don't know the age group here or the experience level, but the minute you start playing doubles, your, your triples will swing harder. So one of the very easy, very easy concept, like I said, right, left, left. I'll, I'll play the bass drum. And then right, right, left. So then you have the upbeat accent and in jazz that actually propels the beat and makes it swing harder. So I'll do, the, I'll do the first one then I'll switch to the second one. But the right hand is always on the downbeat. simple then then do the same thing starting on your left hand left right right left right right and then left left right and that's just a really really good and simple way to warm up your hands just playing triplets Has, have people done that before that exercise because then when you hear when you hear somebody like 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 buddy rich one of the the mysteries well his, his technique was was marvelous but um um, by today's, you know, uh, virtuosity in drumming. I mean, his his technique is uh, almost not his creativity, but his technique is uh, can be replicated. But one of the things that I always he heard him do a lot was things like those rim shots thrown in there, and just those patterns, reversing those patterns back and forth on the snare drum, with some other things mixed in, of course. But I love that exercise. And then, then one other thing I find real helpful for uh, 
for developing a, a swing feel and using triplets, eighth note triplets and sixteenth note triplets, is rolling in triplet. And if, um, has everybody done that? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. All right. Cool. So then that's so. Let's just take then a five stroke roll because five stroke roll is a clearly in general three wrist wrist motions but going off of this basic c concept just take the five stroke roll you can accent just put the single note of the five in on any part of the triplet so the first one would clearly be like that but just don't practice it i always um one of the things i like to do is always have whenever you're playing on the snare drum i call the snare drum is often the center of the universe when we take off when we play a fill or whatever we're doing. So just move that then up to here so you're putting the doubles on one of your high toms. So that sounds like this. And then roll on the floor tom. Like that. And then the, you get some motion. This motion, especially when you're pulling, when you're starting this way and pulling that way. I noticed that with some of my students at UArts, this is not a motion that they're very used to or don't utilize very very much so that's a fun one to practice and then so then like we talked about just with the basic triplets when you put double strokes and you accent the last note of the triplet then that swings hard I do this all the time I like this or up here Just shift in the accent around, and then in the middle note of the triplet, when you're putting the accent in the middle note, one, two, three, four. That's a note that sometimes people ignore when they're playing jazz, the middle note of the triplet, but that's a really, really cool one, too. It gets you some really, really excellent phrasing when you're doing that. And then any of the, all the measured rolls, actually, if, you're, if everybody knows those and you've studied rudimental drumming, just up using all of them in the context of, uh, of rolling in triplets, eighth notes or or 16th note triplets. If anybody played the solo three camps, that's a really good exam example of five stroke rolls like this. Seven stroke rolls, Philly Joe Jones, one of the, the, the uh, maybe arguably, but not to me, one of the greatest, most swinging drummers in history, played a lot of seven stroke rolls. Like one, two, one, two, three, four. Kind of like that. And sort of back phrase them a little bit so they felt big and fat. A little bit of a sloppy roll technique. If you'll notice, because I, I play a lot of brushes, so sometimes my brush technique goes into my snare playing, so it's not straight up and down like this. Sometimes it looks like this. I guess when you first start playing the drums, if you did that, <laughs> your teacher would tell you you're doing it wrong. But actually, it feels good to me, and it, makes, it helps me back phrase more. So... Same idea, seven around the drum, the, the drum set. But I find that to be really, really helpful. And a lot of times, um, you know, if you're not used to playing that way or rolling that way, then the the, the tempos can kind of pick up because it's a clearly a, a slower rate than rolling in 30 seconds or something. But I find it to be amazingly helpful just just for your hands. Does anybody have any questions about those rolling that way? I mean, the same is, same thing is true for par for playing paradiddles that way. One, two, three, four. <laughs> And then you can get like an overlay in the accent of like a half note triplet when you're when you're playing paradiddles in single paradiddles with triplet phrasing. Does anyone have, have any questions about that? And I'm going to show you one other one of one other really cool thing to work on your swing groove, which also has applications to Afro-Cuban rhythms like a bembe or nanango, and certainly certain styles of hip hop. Anything that's divided by a triplet. So no, we don't. We don't have any, yeah, we don't have any questions at the moment. I think it's funny you're talking about uh, this being slower than 30 second notes, and obviously, but you're still blazing around over there. <laughs> well, I can do it. Well, you know, and like, it's, you know, I'm at a, I don't want to, certainly, and I know, um, I've heard Alex taught, uh, Alex and I taught at a drum set camp, and that's where we first met, and I watch with astonishing virtuosity the way that that he plays but i i don't i don't know it's hard you're more at a slight disadvantage because i don't know how i don't know anybody's level of experience so i certainly mm -hmm. don't want to i don't want to talk 
down to anybody in any way or, you know, have them think, oh, that's so simple. I could do this in the third grade versus <laughs> versus <laughs> doing anything oh, so, no, not so at crazy all. that people don't understand. But that, you know, so, yeah, the, the five stroke roll thing and the rolling and triplet is a, a huge deal. And I'm sure Alex will chime in when he starts talking, too. But I'll play the bass drum somewhat loud. So instead of if I'm rolling in six, uh, let me I'll roll in eighth notes. This everybody clearly knows eighth, eighth note triplets. Then, 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 you know, just, just playing the, through, through all the basic subdivisions of a quarter note. And I wildly recommend everybody uh, at a variety of tempos. Then my, one of my teachers, um, two of my teachers made me do this because when I got to college, I was obnoxious and was playing a lot of what I like to call now drumnastics. And I mean, mm -hmm. I wasn't really being musical at all. I was like, look what I can do, you know, like mm -hmm. a trained, you know, circus performer. <laughs> As we all do. Yeah, yeah. I know we can't help it, damn it. But, um, you know, I had to play solos. The first thing I had to do was play solos just based on a, a quarter note. Just quarter notes. That's all I, all I could play. And like, I couldn't do it. I literally could not do it. I had no concept of looking at this amazing instrument and thinking about it in a deeply musical way. I was just like, look how fast I can play and look at this thing and that thing. And it changed my, it changed my life, my musical life. And I, I am, you know, very, very extremely passionate and all of my, as I've gotten older, I'm 99% just focused on, you know, straight ahead jazz. That's my passion and my mission in life. But if everybody could, could go from all the basic, basic subdivisions of a measure of four, I'll think about playing solos in whole notes, half notes, half note triplets, quarter note, quarter note triplets, eighth note, eighth note triplets, uh, 16th note, 16th note triplets, and 32nd notes. And those are all the basic ones. Of course, uh, you can definitely add quintuplets and septuplets in there and use, you play those subdivisions with single strokes and with double strokes. Definitely orchestrating things around your drum set is a huge deal. That gives you like a lot of creative variety if you can make yourself start on a different drum or if you think to yourself, oh, my chops are so great on the snare drum. And then, you know, okay, well, let's play that same thing on the floor, Tom. You know, especially if you're, you're in control of your technique to execute things the way that you like. But there's, I mean, I, I warm up a lot by playing all of the, all the measured roles in different subdivisions. It's kind of a ripoff of, uh, is anyone familiar with Alan Dawson's rudimental ritual? What he's done with brushes and with sticks. He plays like a, he plays a samba in his foot. Oh, this makes people like this. So he starts this groove, and then he just plays all, he overlays like, oh, he's got a bunch of hybrid rudiments too. But I do that with um, all the measured rolls, so. I just play through the whole sequence of the basic measured rolls. I love warming up that way. It's another teacher of mine gave that to me, and it helps me loosen up my hands. And then you could do that in triplet too. So that's really, you know, I find that to be really, really fun. But yeah, and Alex and I were talking about the, the diligence of, of practicing and, um, you know, uh, and uh, actually um, Mark DiCiani is big on this, um, the practicing with a really, really focused attention. So if you say to yourself, you know, my double is, my double strokes are no good, then you have to be willing to sit with yourself with the, at the drums or at a, at a drum pad and just, you know, and do, the, let me use my hand, and do the thing that you need to do for, you know, if you have to practice this, to make the second note of your double even, and you have to you have to sit there and you have to do that as slow and patient until you can you can get that happening. Because mm -hmm. te technique is so technique is so that you can execute the music you hear in your heart, in your head. A lot of historically, and when when Alex made reference to jazz, is how this instrument developed. Then I want to show you guys something really cool. <clears throat> My mentor was a guy named Stanley Kay, and he did manage the Buddy, the Buddy Rich Band. So he was deeply involved in the historical sense. I might have to, oh, he, here it is. Do you guys, anybody know who Baby Dodds was? Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's, actually, there's a really funny record called, it, it's called, a, <laughs> there's four sides of drummers talking. My teacher, Adam Nussbaum, gave this to me. It's Papa Joe and Baby Dodds, and uh, Elvin might be on there. But anyway, some of this is like, golden information and that was a through concept was you got to play for the benefit of the band play for the benefit of the band the benefit of the band all the time and traditionally some drummers by today's standards had no technique at all like ser like really and i'm you know like when i showed my mother how to play we will rock you she sat down and she could play it <laughs> without without technique and not with the right feel but you know so so traditionally 
as jazz evolved and the instrument evolved and the players, like I said before, virtuosity level is like off the hook today. It, it's crazy. But these people play with a uh, deep, deep approach to, to groove and pocket and playing, playing for the benefit of the band. So as you develop your own technique, I just think to yourself, if you can't play something because you haven't worked on your left hand, then that's, if that's something you want to work on, then go and work on it, but do it every day. I think, uh, like I mentioned, Mark DiCiani, five, five or 10 minutes a day repeating a thing that's kicking your butt is way better than trying to cram. I don't think you can cram technique, like you can't cram experience. Better to get a little dose every day. Uh, mm -hmm. So, if, if you, but you know, that's everybody's in, individual, um, everybody's individual desire for their technical development. If you're, I have, I had one student years ago who just wanted to be the world's fastest drummer and was constantly entering those contests. I think he was like a semi-finalist in Scranton or something. <laughs> Oh, like then, the, the drumometer kind of things. Yeah. yeah. But th then I kept, well, I just wanted him to then tell me how he was going to use it musically. Like a lot of people with that kind of insane virtuosity do use it incredibly musically. But mm -hmm. Some people don't. Okay. So then here's, let me show you this uh, one other jazz centric exercise. And this also has to do with the eighth note triplet. And it's, it's, it's really, it's, we're going to just do combinations of singles and doubles between our bass drum and our left hand or tom toms if you, if you want to. Um, and uh, if, you know, I do have a. There's a I have a, um, a YouTube channel, and then there's a educational mini lessons in there, and this is one of them. I like to call this swing, swang, swung. But you can have lots of applications to it with your feet too. So you would start a basic jazz groove, and just when you're doing this, um, everyone, if you want to check your subdivision, you just play some triplets in your left hand and do this, and make so that you make sure you're getting a triplet feel instead of. dotted eighth and sixteenth, which to me don't sound as good. And you'll notice with, with my hand, when I play, no matter what tempo I play, I move my wrist or my arm twice per measure when I'm playing, when I'm playing swing. So I'm going to start on two. One, two, three, four. I throw the stick down, I let it bounce twice, then I grab it with my fingers. So actually, literally beat one and beat three are getting made by my fingers pulling the stick up. So it doesn't matter if I'm playing this. Or it's all the same the same technique. Mm -hmm. So okay. Yeah, that, that technique helps a lot too when you have to raise the tempo as well. Yeah, but in, and you know if you're playing even eighth notes or even too. But that wasn't even. Yeah, it's just it's the same and utilization of the bounce and your fingers. So mm -hmm. anyway, so the first so there's a. Eight, eight basic divisions, everyone that you really, especially if you want to sound like you're, if you ever have to have to play jazz or you're on a gig or doing a, a show, like when you play in a Broadway show, um, if you're lucky to get that job, you'll be making a six figure salary. And if you're doubling on percussion, you'll even make even more. And then, but you have to know how to play a variety of groups. Sometimes you're, oh, look, it's 1930s swing. Oh, now it's a funk tune. Now it's a mambo. And you have to really <laughs> understand what all of these are and how to make them feel good. So this, this is the, Here's, here's what they are. So the base, the first one is this, sort of like what we did with our hands when we first started. Triple let, triple let, triple let. So bass drum is that. So it sounds like this. So then I'm going to, I'm going to turn that around. So now I'm going to play. And so then right after that, it would be this. And then, can you hear all, all the drum? My cymbals sound so loud in my headphones. Can you guys hear the bass drum and everything? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Ooh. good. All right. So those are, the, those are the first four. So just, I mean, and practice those. And I have all of my students always practice in terms of time. I don't, you know, sometimes I've uh, been guilty of this myself when I was younger too. I'd, like, I'd struggle to learn a groove. I'd play the groove for like four measures and i'd be patting myself on the back yeah man you nailed it and then i was like well, but wait a minute but the song's 20 minutes long so then i would uh you know i always have my students minimal you know even in their lessons like let's play this but let's play it for five minutes and let's make it let's make it flawless and not not change anything not change the accents unless you really want to and try to keep that consistency and i always revert back to the, the snare part to bolero everybody probably knows that this right 
Everybody's heard that, I'm sure. It's been featured in several movies. So the snare drummer does that and starts at quadruple piano and crescendos to quadruple forte over the course of 17 to 20 minutes. That's massive, massive consistency to be able to do that with a full dynamic range. That's why the snare drummer always gets a bow when you play in an orchestra and do that. So think of, think of that for yourselves, everyone. You know, don't, I'm not accusing you, but in case you've ever had that moment of like, I nailed this groove, but you've played it for like four or eight measures, then make yourself go back and play it for four or eight minutes and then uh, proceed from there. Okay, so there's, so those were the first four of those. Let me review them for you again. This one, triple it, triple it, triple it. And, well. Then. And then. Okay, then this next one is, is uh, this is kind of a, reverse shuffle, so your bass drum is sort of shuffling, and so you're going to play the middle note of that triplet with your left hand. Then actually shuffling this hand and putting the bass drum in the middle note of the triplet. And then, then, the, then the final two are, are just alternating hands. And start on my. Now I'll start on the snare drum this time. I think you're probably here. I'm putting in some phrasing accents, trying to make it uh, feel a little bit, bit more like music. Whenever you're playing any sort of exercise, I find it very, very helpful not to play it monotone and flat. I've heard so many people play an exercise, and you know it sounds very much like a. I always think of a, a, a flat line on a heart monitor. You know, that's, that's never good for anybody <laughs> when you see the blind go flat. So I even, uh, you know, and that, that actually transforms the phrasing quite a bit. The minute you shift your accents around or your phrasing accents or internal dynamics, it can really make a huge difference in how musical you are. Any questions about any of that? I kind of just flew through it. I mean, you could actually take, so let me just say it, rephrase it again what the exercise is. You take the eighth note triplet, just an eighth note triplet, no other rhythm. You play a, without unchanging jazz ride simple pattern and I had hi hat on two and four and just move you know to play two notes in one limb and one note in another limb and use your tom toms in between your between your right foot and your left and your left hand so that's basically what the exercise is or Ethan has a question he's asking are these exercises on your page anywhere yeah yeah those you can play it with me on my youtube channel if you want Okay. Cool. Or this one, this one actually, I have this in a handout too. I sent you a couple different handouts. Yeah. I can I can forward that to you. And uh, yeah, we'll be sending those handouts to everyone as well. Or then you can go like the first the first pages of Stick Control. I'm sure everyone has that book. All the first three pages are just rights and are uh, eighth notes. But you can play those patterns as eighth literal eighth. Try to just swing the eighth note. So you can just take the pattern, whatever it is, and try to play it as an eighth note triplet. That's mm -hmm. really fun to do too. And it, you know, if you if you can do that, then you put you know add, start adding your you know your hi hat in there a little bit too to make your um, pattern more contemporary sounding. Or this actually this was was a point I was trying to make before when I was talking about Broadway. Then I lost track of what I was saying. To have your playing sound in a more uh, bebop sense instead of just the swing era, because that's what I was saying before. When someone says let's play jazz, uh, some people immediately think of Glenn Miller or In the Mood. Some people might think of John Coltrane or Charlie Parker. Some people might think of, of uh, you know, Pat Metheny or the Yellow Jackets or some, you know, or Tower of Power. Jazz mm -hmm. is a huge umbrella. And it's, there, there's so many different uh, styles of playing. And there's so many different styles of swinging, you know, like there is with all, all sorts of music. You can't just, it's a, it's a hard thing to, uh, to pin down to one thing. And then it's, of course, very wildly subjective based on the, uh, the players you like and the style and the feel you like. I, mm -hmm. I could never stand it. Um, lead trumpet players in jazz seem to be notorious for uh, criticizing each other, but I was on a drummer's forum once and I, I heard someone say something like, yeah, man, Elvin smoked, buddy, or like something completely absurd to me. I'm like, what? what? <laughs> it's like you're comparing two different geniuses and thinking one is better than another. It's very strange. Yeah, it's, it's like whenever you're on YouTube, you'll just find endless amounts of... Uh, this drummer versus this drummer, or this person versus this person. It's just a compilation of each of them doing their own thing. And 
the comments going crazy like oh this guy killed it no this guy killed it you know yeah i actually did um uh, there's a thing called uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center has a thing called Jazz Academy, and it's all free lessons, and they're very short. They're like five or six minutes. So I did, you know, I've done a couple. One is about playing the blues, and there's a few other things in there. But I did this, what I showed you guys about the five-stroke roll, and it was literally, I was like, here's how you can swing a five-stroke roll. So I played one, two, three, four. You know, three, four. And I, I play through it, and I'm playing a little with my my friend on bass, and I'm just explaining it. And man, <laughs> the guy from Jazz at Lincoln Center wrote to me, and he said, you know, that's one of our most watched videos, and people really liked it. And I started reading some of the comments, and they were like, thanks, this is cool, this is helpful. Then, of course, there's always that one person like, you suck, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it makes me crack up laughing. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> what a mental patient. <laughs> And I, you know, I have many of my idols have done stuff on there too. And uh, I, I read the comments. I don't know what people are thinking. I'm sorry. I was having a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> I forgive you <laughs> that you fessed up. But you know, that kind of stuff just, yeah, man, I, as I've, um, Alex, I don't know about you, but I'm just significantly older than you. But when I was younger, you know, sometimes if, before, literally before the internet, when things were just, you'd get a review in the paper and sometimes it would, you know, for, for something. And if uh, like uh, one reviewer, I remember uh talked about like one like three sentences about the music but then went on to to misidentify instruments like calling a sax solo a flute solo and just had mostly ho horrible things to say about the appearance of the band the drummer's a barbie girl i, I had i had <laughs> farrah fawcett hair back then if you can believe it but you know got to get a thick skin sometimes in this business man mm -hmm. yeah anyway. and a, lo a lot of the comments are at at things that really have no bearing Oh, I know. It's it's crazy. But you know, that's that's, you know, I mean, you could I mean, I mean as Alex knows, we could go on with any any singular subject and and just do these exercises, but maybe I'll uh, toss it off to Alex and uh we could go, you know, maybe shift back and forth from some of our different uh philosophies. Sure. Yeah, sounds great. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um gen generally speaking when it comes to comments and negative comments, I tend to classify them as three things. Clowns, burnouts, and drumming incels. So those three, and you just always remember, they're always fools and don't suffer them. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd go on with that. Also, if, if you've ever, if anyone's ever posted like a video of themselves drumming on YouTube, you probably know, like you've probably had one or two negative comments. Because, yeah, it's just, th there's always someone to say something. They're, they're always clowns. Just ignore them. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's usually the way that I see it. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to go off of what Sherry said, especially rudimentally, because uh, I too believe the rudiments are obviously a huge part of our vocabulary, especially stemming from jazz drumming. And as she said, three camps was also a big one for me in both the hands and the feet. So uh, I worked on a double bass, but we're not talking about double bass today because I, <laughs> there, I'm just, uh, I think, uh, I feel like double bass is one of those topics that, especially now, has become sort of a hot, to uh, hot button, where a lot of people are very interested in learning it. But I feel like we want to learn it. Whoa! Uh, I feel like a lot of people are interested in learning it, but they. Uh, there, there's a prerequisites that I like students to do, and I insist that people do as well when it comes to it. And one thing is, I believe that you need the rudiments in the hands down first before you attempt them in your feet. You also need a solid foundation with your hands before working on your feet as well. And so I'm a big proponent of a rudimental studies, but b proper rudimental studies in both the hands and the feet. So I know a lot of drummers want to play really, really fast with their feet and with their hands. But if you, with control comes speed, not the other way around. So take take it from someone who should have learned that lesson a long time, when I was a wee lad, um, I should have learned that lesson and I didn't. So I had to spend a lot of time correcting bad habits. So that was uh, not, not, not such a pleasant experience having to completely re revamp my hand technique and revamp my approach to the instrument, but all things considered. All right. Um, so 
One thing though that I always stress is the, the hand technique that I use is the finger control technique. It's a combination really actually of two different techniques, but we'll start out with uh, the finger control technique, which I uh, adapted uh, using the, rather the, a lot of people hold the stick down in the tips of their fingers, but what I did was pull the stick further in so that I could get the power of the inside of my hand. So using more the in, the full finger motion to get a little more power. So this is into a pillow and I can still pull the stroke out with each finger, including the fulcrum. So So I can do this now in both hands into any surface, which is very important when utilizing this technique on the drum set. So the technique that I, the, the development of this technique that I used um, was you start, you do, or we're gonna do 16 uh, notes on each finger, including the fulcrum. So these two fingers will always be on the stick. We'll go between these, but at the same time, we're also going to use just the first finger. So, middle, ring, pinky, back, ring, pinky. Okay, once you have that, what you want to do then is incorporate dynamics. So I'll go from pianissimo to fortissimo and back down. Middle. Ring. Pinky. So that is very good for developing dynamic control within the fingers because that then helps you really, really have uh, a lot of articulation and um, definition within your strokes. And this is onto a mattress topper. So, you know, onto a snare drum, you can really fly, but e even on here, I can still. Still get quite a bit of speed. So that's my first technique. The second is a rendition of the molar technique that I came up with, which involves the whip stroke. But what happens is that the wrist generates the accent and then the fingers utilize the, it utilizes the snap of the fingers to generate the pull up. So rather than really using kind of the full, the full wrist motion that a lot of people use, I use just the, just within the kind of the hand. And the wrist to use the fingers, the snap of the fingers to generate the accent. So between those two techniques, you get both accents and dynamic control. So that's pro predominantly the foundation of my my technical approach. Now another thing that, and I've been very much into this as of late, is. Uh, and that I really wanted to go over is counting while doing these type of exercises. So one thing that I've been working on for my new book is I call, I call them even and odd counting rates. And what they are is if you're taking an even sticking, you're going to count in odd rates over it. So let's just take a double stroke roll, right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left, right. Okay. Now we're going to count three over this as so three eighth notes. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One two three 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 let's do five one two three four five one two three four five one three four five one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five so we're counting odd uh, odd rates against an even sticking so that's teaching your brain to then hear a different subdivision over that sticking and you're working your internal clock as well as your hand technique. So it's a way to, I found as a way to feel very productive while practicing and really work a lot of different things at once. Then if we're going to take an odd sticking, let's say a three, right, left, left, uh, one-on-one cherry shift, 
Right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left, left. Then we'll count four, two first, then four. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, four. One, two, three, 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 two, three, four. So those are cross rhythmic counting rates, which are basically subdivisions within the same note rate, but that are just a diff. an odd subdivision or even subdivision that overlaps. Then you have polyrhythmic counting where it's a different pulse within the same time. So you have the two overlapping rates. So for that, let's take double strokes. We're gonna count three polyrhythmically. One, two, three. So one, two, three, 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 two, three, one, two, three. Five, one, two, three, four, 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 five, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So that's now you're counting in odd subdivisions over the even sticking, but polyrhythmically. So now you're strengthening your quintuplets, your septuplets, all of these odd groupings. And I found that this is a really, really good way to kind of strengthen a lot of different facets at once. Now, if you want to speed it up, we can do then you could take like a uh, a slower rate for example or you could take let's say this we could take eight so why don't you then let's count septuplets so at a one two three four five six seven eight one two three four five six seven eight let's count septuplets one two three four five six seven 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 so at that point, my I found my internal clock has been very strengthened by doing this. Um, now, another thing we can do is then I call these tertiary modulations because what you do is you take an even numbered phrase in an odd subdivision. So let's say we're all right, paradiddles. Now we're going to switch to quintuplets. One, two, three. Okay, now in quintuplets, we're going to play threes in each end. Five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. Okay, now we're gonna count a different rate over this. So now we're gonna count eleven over this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So on and so forth. So I call those tertiary modulations in the sense that now you're thinking within an entirely different um subdivision entirely. And you really start experimenting with pushing the time and strengthening your internal subdivision as well as kind of your polyrhythmic phrasing. And I have this, my, my metronome app on my phone. Um, I found that doing this stuff, I was able to really take, um, let's say take the metronome and put it at 30. So stretching the time, soloing polyrhythmically within this, even on a, even on a mattress topper. So there I just took the quarter note of like basically playing one of every bar and we can completely go off um, doing 13. So 13s I count as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six. We could do uh, 19s, which I count as one and a two, we and a three and a four and a one, two, three. And as your internal clock gets strengthened, you can start hearing these. So let's do 13s. Uh, Three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six. So there we are. We're solo or improvising in 13 tuplets. 19 would be, so that would be. Two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and one. So 
So you're strong with some very large subdivisions right there. And I've been finding that doing a lot of this stuff has been very helpful for me. Now, another thing that I, I uh, talk to my students a lot about, micro timing. So a really good exercise that I do with this is you take the metronome, you can put it as eight notes. So you can do this as clapping. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So measure on the beat, measure off the beat. And I've been finding that as Sherry said about the second triplet uh, within jazz, I feel like drummers tend to be very weak with the second triplet and the E and the uh, uh especially in Western music. So, uh, and uh, jazz drummers are different. Obviously jazz drummers are much stronger on those because jazz is a lot of offbeat and um, much more focused on avoiding the downbeat. But your standard drummer, young drummer today is it I, I found has tended to be uh, very downbeat dependent. So I find this is a good way to break the dependence on the downbeat. Now, and then what you could do is then use half a half of that. So this would be one, two, three, four, and, 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 and two and three and four uh, one then the metronome uh is on the e now e e in so one, in in e uh and sorry now the i So my old practice roommate, uh, a drummer named Lenny Reese, showed that to me, and um, this has been was a huge development for my micro timing studies. And so one thing that I would then try to do would be uh, improvise solo phrases with the metronome on the E like that. So E and a E and a three. So doing stuff like that and then speeding it up. So here's 103. Ian. So at any tempo, still being accurate with those subdivisions. Uh, and I found that that was tremendously helpful for me in developing a lot of this. This also came from uh, studying with a drummer named Ari Honig, who was very interested, uh, who's a Philly native, so shout out, um, that he was very into uh, singing and clapping exercises. So this was tremendously uh, impactful on my approach to that stuff. Now, uh, something, another thing that uh, I think is useful that uh, I don't think that many people work on these days. Well, I think people are getting more into them, but the hybrid rudiments. And um, I feel like the hybrid rudiments, actually, there's a lot of really cool musical phrases in those. So uh, I work a lot on some some of the more uh, esoteric combinations. So there's some there's uh, some of the cheesed rudiments. Now, the way that they define cheese is basically doubling a flam. So instead of right, you know, open flame, you would have. So it's just like basically making a 60 note on flam. Now that can be really cool what done on a cymbal.
Um, and there, there's a lot of cool possibilities there. So I've been working a lot with those, uh, a lot of those kind of unusual combinations of working those to the rhythmic scale and adding them into more, um, more of the standard rudiment. So say we have like a paradiddle, let's say, doing it. putting the cheese in different places there. And I found that my phrasing actually, it's really helped my ghost my ghost note phrasing and it's helped my left hand technique quite a bit. So then another one that I've been doing a lot of three stroke rolls and four stroke rolls, four strokes too, but three strokes, especially because um, you know, as Sherry was talking about using the open of the wrist and the two fingers to pull the stick up. And I try to even my hands out as much as possible because I'm very much into ambidexterity. So trying to get so three in each hand. Now, the reason I like doing these is they really open up a lot of the different flam rudiments, like flam taps, flam accents, um, uh, pataflaflas, just stuff with it, you know, where you need these. And doing the threes really helps with those. So. I uh, I'm kind of boiling it down to the core fundamentals when it comes to, I believe the most important things to practice when it comes to this stuff, at least are singles, doubles, but also threes and fours too, if you want to get into, uh, for me, it's mostly in the fingers. So I usually I think I used to be able to do it at, so this is 280 nature. Yeah, too slow. All right, four is a 300. Too slow. 320. Okay. So, yeah, and once you get your threes down as well, you then have. And that's into a mattress topper too. So the control should translate over between surfaces. But I spent a lot of time of um, working hand technique on this mattress topper because, and um, this uh, it's really helped me develop develop much more control and dexterity within those motions. Now, um, something another exercise that I've been working on that's gonna be in the upcoming book, and this will be expanded on. But I find this to be uh, quite an interesting. Ghosting exercise, also it can be interesting for jazz, uh, it, depending on how deep you want to dive into this, but it's a polyrhythmic exercise where you keep one hand going with an ostinato. So for now we'll do three sixteenths, and then we're going to play components of the rhythmic scale in the other hand against it. Here comes the quintuplets. Sextuplets. Septuplets. All right, now the left hand and we'll do the right hand doing the rhythmic scale against the two. Four, five, six, seven, so you also want to be able to repeat this with each limb against this um against the ostinato but that's just the beginning of it and this sort of idea that when when you're playing in one limb for example
the other the others can completely separate not just with the you know the same rate or moving the notes but actually separate rate and completely solo on their own So completely moving rates with each limb. And um, you obviously want to be able to do this. So yeah, that's been something I've also been working on is separating my limbs like that so that I can now really obtain complete freedom in each limb rather than simply the, rather than simply improvising within 16ths or 8ths triplets really being able to stretch out and virtually um have each limb feel time completely on its own so i found that this is a good exercise to begin with that and i oh, i was looking at the chat um i i really do believe that this can also help develop strength within these subdivisions as hearing them against standard 16th or, or triplet ostinatos can be tremendously helpful. Um, oh, any suggestions for getting my roles faster besides practice? Absolutely not. That is just practice, practice, practice. Um, the, the only thing that I'll say about getting your roles fast, um, so here's the, here's the thing, uh, and this is getting speed is about proper form, because if you tense up like this, and just muscle it out, you're going to hurt yourself a lot. So you want to get the speed using proper form and proper technique, because when you do that, you can A, sustain the speed, and B, you'll be able to sustain the speed as well for periods of your life and not just uh, have your arms and, and ankles completely shot within a decade. So. My advice would be develop proper technique and work on proper exercises and do not push too far too fast. Meaning don't um, don't try and just play really, really fast at first without laying the groundwork and developing the prerequisites. So, but if you if I were to give it uh, an exercise for this, for uh, I think helping to develop really good rules, it is you do a bar, of 16th so one bar of singles and one bar of doubles and make them try to sound as close to identical as possible um and that is uh i find a good exercise to develop the articulation now then what i'll do is i'll also do one with molar technique. So then you want to try and bring the accent in. So alternation. Passer. So you want accents, articulation, and develop control with that. So really as a uh, the great Yoni Madar once told me, it's about motion, technique is motion, and it's about keeping things loose and you and really it becomes like a martial art or like a dance, is how we described it. And that's how I view really the motions of this is that when you see a dance, a ballet dancer move, there's no tension in their limbs. And I feel like drums is similar to me in the sense that you don't want tension in your limbs. You want, um, you, you really want to make sure that your limbs still are, even as fast as you play, you're not uh, tensing up or relying on twitch speed, I should say. And so that to me is a, a big part of this foundation. So just remember that when you're practicing those, when you're practicing and developing those roles. Um, now another thing that i would say as well is we've all got a weak hand so i try to do as many exercises as i can with unisons rather than just one hand so i try to do as many like when i do my fingers 
I try to do them with both hands and avoid flamming. So both hands are even. Same thing goes with molar. So that way both hands develop evenly and you really hear the unisons. Now, when I say avoid flamming, there's another exercise as well we can incorporate with that where you do a bar of unisons and then a bar of alternating flam. So So there's also that. And therefore you shouldn't necessarily completely avoid flams, but when you're try when you're practicing unisons, go for unisons and then work on flams like that. And I found that working alternating flams and unisons both have really helped develop the two different motions in my hands of accents and then no accents as well as finger control versus wrist control. Now I'd also emphasize do not work on just one or the other. Don't, for example, I see a lot of people really working on push pull a lot lately. Um, and yeah, that's cool, but you don't want to just, you don't want to default to that. You want to make sure that all the gears are working together. So I'm just a very, a big proponent of working on wrists, fingers, extended techniques, but really having foundational elements. I mean, two with traditional, like doing the ring finger as well as fulcrum match, just a lot of different things. So I'm comprehensive practice is really what I would emphasize. Awesome. We also have a question from Aaron. I wanted to ask thing really quick first mm -hmm. on the note of hand speed, because I did quite a few years of another exercise as well that I was curious on your take. It's mm -hmm. probably within the same vein, but just, you know, starting slow and building up like a couple BPM at a time for a certain number of repetitions, maybe like 30 seconds worth or something like that. And then just going up a couple of BPM until you hit a point where your technique is falling apart and then like backing off and going back down to your starting BPM as a way of like training your, your hand speed. That's a good one. I, uh, when it came for me, so for me, the one that I used a little more for that was actually using the rhythmic scale. So it was a similar thing, but rather than using a couple BPM, I'd use different subdivisions. So for example, you take like, let's say, And just going up with the subdivisions like that. So I think it's a great exercise. That was just my take. But if it works with the doing it with BPM, that's great too. Um, yeah, I, I think it's great, uh, and I know a lot of people use that, and it, no, no objections to it whatsoever. Awesome. Um, we had a question from Aaron, and he wanted to ask himself. Please, um, Aaron, are you there? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, it's probably going to be a bit awkward to type the whole thing out, but um, I was wondering if uh if you had any advice for starting that ostinato thing that you were doing earlier where you had the three sixteenth notes and then you were moving through the rest of the rhythmic scale mm -hmm. on the other hand is three sixteenths is that like the default way to start the best way to start is there another like thing that make no, it easier going that's just uh that that's just my default ostinato that's just sort of seems like my excuse for a starting place when really you would have you could also just do quarter notes and then do like, you know, and you could do something against quarter notes. Something like that. You could also do eight notes. There's plenty of different ones. I would recommend doing a simple one first. So maybe starting with quarters. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and then go from there as your limbs develop more, more facility and control with it. Awesome. Uh, looks like that's it for the questions at the moment. Does anyone else have any questions? I would like to give this one back over to Sherry because I'd love to hear her input on some of these thoughts and exercises and her kind of where, where she's yeah. 
the hand development stuff. That's, that's a good point. I'd like to get Sherry's take on some of the questions as well. Uh, excuse me. Okay, Alex, my, my brain is on fire from all that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what I need. You have a glass of wine there? I should have brought that out here with me. <laughs> it said beer, it said beef, brews, and banter. So I was like, hey, beer beats wine and banter. Same Everybody, thing. Drinking and drumming. Woo. All right. <laughs> uh, well, you know, Salud. a very crucial thing for me and in, in my development was to really think about the rebound and really paying attention to that. And I know it seems like a very simple concept, but how, you're, how you let the stick rebound off of whatever surface you're hitting is a huge deal, a huge deal. And some people, I, I was even watching a couple people that are un, uncloaked here watching when Alex was doing, going through his finger control exercises. And some people were doing everything with their wrist and not using their fingers. And that's a really important thing that when you're, like Alex said, when you're developing technique to really, really make sure you're doing, you're doing the thing that you, that you want to be practicing like that. And, and a rebound to me, Alex, right, right? I mean, rebound, right? Some people, like if you watch jazz drummers, like there's a uh, Kenny Washington and not dissimilar from some Tony Williams, uh, Cindy Blackman, who was plays with Santana now. And she was, they use, they don't use as much of a rebound. They use it, but they're they they they're very controlling. They have a lot of uh, they hold the stick maybe tighter than than Alex does. It's very loose, right? My I, I'm pretty loose. Yeah, mine is actually yeah. a lot of people like your back fingers come off. I'm like I'm a bad okay. influence. <laughs> so sue me. But yeah, no, I'm pretty loose actually. Just between these two, and it just sort of like I let it hang there. Um, whereas you see, yeah, like Cindy or Tony. Tony was Tony even described that his primary control came from his two back fingers so tony was you know then cindy too they're, they're very um control very much into the yeah into the kind of just like like what you like what you are just put my well actually i'll just yeah. here's my camera the, so it's so it's just just like you said just i mean that's the way i start with finger control too yeah is this way see if my wrist isn't moving but i just when you practice this everyone make sure that, that that's happening because I, I really saw this and that, yeah, you know, you're like, I, it's not not how fast it is. It's if you're, if you're using the right muscles, muscles, and using yeah. the rebound correctly. And then I, you know, the way that I practiced my role, role I, I don't. This is sounds silly, but I, I did when I first learned how to play a double stroke role. It was just by playing. Um, uh, it was by playing eighth notes and then sixteenth notes, singles and then in doubles and getting faster and faster. And I remember when I was a kid doing that for forty five minutes once. And concentrating on the rebound, and when I finally got that, and with like you were saying, Alex, absolutely zero tension, so you could literally do that for probably hours if you wanted to, yeah. and not have your arms cramp up. Um, but you know, and again, even with all the all the uh, the rhythmic scale, and even the, like I was talking about before with those basic subdivisions, if you just did those those in doubles at something like uh, I don't know, hell, we can do it. Like quarter note equals around eighty. We can do it together. Let me. I'll put my turn this up my camera around again. I'm going to do it on a pad though. Uh, let's see. If you guys have your your sticks so like uh maybe so uh, I think 80 is around. I'm not sure about. I will hold on. I'm on it. Okay. I know it's going to be slightly delayed from this end. But that was around. Okay. So does everybody yes. have a, everybody have your uh we can do this. Everybody have some sticks. We can do this. So you could do it in singles. I, I literally would start with a whole note because yeah. when Alex was playing on 30, I'm telling you to play that whole note at a quarter note equals 30 and make it feel amazing, which is our job and our yep. joy is really freaking hard when you're playing slow. You know, when you're playing slow, there's so much space in between the beats that you can screw up <laughs> unless you're really thinking about how to make it feel great so when you practice this please um it's on one of the handouts that's actually written out like i said before whole note half note half note triplet quarter note quarter note triplet eighth note eighth note triplet 16th note 16th note triplet and 30 second notes so we're going to save a little time we'll just start on the quarter note and of course you'll add dynamics to this and you can orchestrate it but just something like actually you know let me let's, let's not do it we'll do it in doubles because that's i think what we were talking about getting the roll speed faster but you can apply it to, to singles too for sure Look, so if we do this, here's, let me do it this tempo. So, right, right, left, right. So just playing in quarter notes, and I'm bouncing this, and I'm, I'm make, trying to make my stroke as legato as possible, then to triplets, triplet, triplet. Hopefully you can hear this. And eighth notes. Same thing, legato. Then. Then. 
minutes. Then, then, and then go back down just with those basic divisions and making sure that everything is staying legato and smooth and connected and that your, your strokes seem even and feel really good in your hands. I mean, I, I found that to be really, really effective. And then not to just be satisfied when you're on, on, the, on your pad or your snare drum doing it, but then to orchestrate it around the drum set. Because I, I don't know about, uh, you know, one of the, the best things that I, uh, the best things about all drumming is the drummers. You know, we can all look at, like I said at the beginning of this, we can all look at the same groove. Oh yeah, sure, I can play that groove, but you know, then it's how you make it feel that is why we all have different jobs and play in different genres and different band leaders like us and hire us for different you know it's not that we all can't look at the piece of paper and figure out what to do but it's your the, your creativity and your personality and your style that you put into the music the music from the i like to call it music from the neck down when music starts to make you feel something really profound and and deep it's to me something that i like to concentrate on it, especially when my some of my students are when they're studying jazz i teach a jazz improvisation class just for drummers that you arts and it's really cool and part of that is getting them out of uh, like I said before, the drumnastics of it and looking at their instrument in a much different way and how to, like like Ari Honing did. If you don't know Ari Honing, I mean, that guy should be on the cover of I Change Drums magazine. He's incredible. He tunes his drums. He plays nearly pitched perfect melodies. He just did the Ukrainian national anthem, actually, <laughs> on, on the drum set. It's quite extraordinary. D did you work on any of that with him, Alex? Uh, a little bit. Uh, I just... You know, the thing was, it was so much work to do that. And at some point I'm like, am I, there were other things I wanted to get out of the guy. And, and that was just such like an esoteric thing. Like, am I ever going to be able to do this? So I worked on it a little bit and I, I did work on orchestrating like heads, um, you know, heads of tunes on drums. So standard heads, but not to the extent that Ari did. Yeah. But I like that you said what you just said, because that's what, that's sort of what I started my conversation with you all is about that trying to understand what your own goals and vision is for yourself and for your drumming so maybe you don't you know maybe you're not interested in playing jazz at all maybe you're only interested in um you know whatever it might be it could be any it could be anything it could be not playing melodies on the drums but for that that can help you focus your attention especially if you have limited time if i'm not sure if everyone has you know jobs or if everyone's a professional drummer but whatever it is to really say you know what I don't know if I'm that interested in that, but I'm really interested in this and finding your goals and your passion to push yourself forward. But I mean, there's definitely minimal amount of technique required. So um, that exercise, the subdivisions for your roles and singles and doubles, phrase leading with both hands and orchestrating them around the set is a, is a great exercise. I think, but yeah, making sure, I, Louis, Louis, I'm sure you guys know Louis Belson, who he is. One of the great big band drummers, one of the first people credited actually with playing double bass drum, <clears throat> and uh, actually bass the first, I think the first was he? Yeah, really great. Yeah. But I, I was at a PASIC conference. I'm sure everybody knows what PAS is, and um, he goes play. He would just sit there and he play play a role for me, you know, kid. And I I was so uh, you know, I thought I had it down, you know. I know what it is. It's one wrist motion and two sounds. And of course, it would sounded horrible. It was completely lopsided. And <laughs> he's the one that showed me about pulling the second note out with my fingers, and it changed my life but i had to work on that like a lunatic to change what i had learned before that and like alex when you said you were changing certain parts of your technique i remember when i got to when i got to nyu i was playing the ride cymbal in a certain way and um you know the the uh the, my teacher was a guy named elliot zygman and he said no that's not right do it this way and i believed him and that took me a year to change my he's, technique he subbed in one of my ensembles when i was there did he? And he said the exact same thing to me. <laughs> he, uh, he, I got a, I got some tough feedback. <laughs> oh yeah, but then you know, then I when I started, I play a lot of jazz brushes, and my all of my groups, I I used to spin my brush counterclockwise. Get to New York, my teacher said, literally, "What are you doing that for? That's stupid." And then I had to start spinning clockwise. Now that was that's ridiculous. Can you demonstrate the hit thing? What's that? Oh, I'm seeing a note, but I can't, I don't know what it would quite. <laughs> Maybe you can reiterate that question and I'll try to answer it. You said, can you demonstrate the hi-hat thing? Um, <coughs> Sorry. Also, if you want to unmute and ask yourself, you can go ahead also. I think it's Ethan, right? I'm not sure which hi-hat one. Oh, by my right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. 
Uh, that was that's easy enough. <laughs> and this, but you know what? Actually, everyone, I really, and I tell this to every single one of my students. I mean, besides the essential fundamentals that we really have, we play singles, we play doubles, we play multiple bounce strokes and buzz strokes. But that's, and then we have different foot pedal technique. But those are that's what happens in our hands. If you're executing those properly the way you want, then if a teacher says to you that's wrong. Well, then if it, the music sounds good and it, it, there's like when people say that's cheating or this is the, you know, you can't do it that way. You can, of course you can, as long as the music sounds great. That's all that matters. I <laughs> just wanted to throw that out there. But yep, I will show you. I got my, let me do oh, Sorry, that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened? <laughs> Oops. All right. Yeah, I was doing this. And I know you can't see my whole whole arm in this picture right this minute, but he wanted me to do what, what we dem Alex and I both demonstrated. I'm not going to call it a molar stroke, but it's kind of the whipping motion. Instead of playing straight into the cymbal. I mean, I would be the same if I'm playing anything like a, that's even eighth note too. I, I, I rarely will play a... I will more like, you know, almost not, not go side to side, but almost try to try to have a couple of different points on the cymbal. Like it feels better. So using wrist and motion and, and flow and flow because the, your, your limb, your whole limb from your shoulder is all, it's all moving in time. And I think that when I was, when I was younger and started playing, that was, it seems like it's such an obvious thing, but it's not necessarily intuitive when you're like, here, take a stick and go hit that and make it music, we'll, we'll take a stick and we'll... But not realizing that every single motion that we're doing is in, is in time too, and creates, creates the, the, the time quite literally and groove and the flow of all your strokes between all your limbs. So that was that. So I was just straight on constantly and just to shift my shoulder to get that. Comfortable. It took me like, I would say, honestly, a year before I felt like, that's it, I finally got it. And it changed my life, and I'm glad I listened to him. <laughs> the brush thing, I'm not so sure. I'm glad I listened, but now I spin both ways. <laughs> that guy. Yeah, he uh, he basically told me in my ensemble, he's like, yeah, you're not doing this right. That sounds terrible. Oh, yeah. When I moved to New York, in well, way back in 1985, I had... This great drum teacher, his name is Joe Cusadas. He wrote a book, uh, I don't know, what the hell is it called, man? It's got like a mo modern pattern, patterns for the modern drummer. It was really great, like ways to, you know, flow around the kit, you know, clockwise and counterclockwise. So I go to take a lesson and he had big speakers and it's like huge speakers, like not Marshall stacks, but crazy loud speakers. And he would put on a record like deafening. So I start playing and same thing, Alex, he said, oh my God, that was terrible. <laughs> So it kind of gives you encouragement to go forth. But I'm, I, I'm without, I mean, when I practice today, I find a distinct difference between practicing and playing. And I hope maybe you guys do too, because it's very different. Practicing is when I practice, I say, Sherry, you're really bad at this, or you really want, I really want to improve something. So I'll co I come out and I don't, you know, it could be, it could be one thing that I'll, I would just do for, for 30 minutes. At least that's part of when I come out to play. And then there's playing and there's other things. There's reading and there's trying to figure out how to play grooves better. And then I, the, one of the hands, handouts that I sent over that I, you should read, I, I hope you'll read it, is about creativity in drumming and what that means. And I'm going to say a, a drum solo, whether you're soloing in time on the form of a song or you're just playing a free solo, like some drummers love when there's just a fermata or someone just looks at the drummer and says, solo! And then you do whatever you want. And then sometimes, especially in jazz, you really have to play on the forms of certain songs and, uh, you know, concentrate on, I'm not going to say more musical, but definitely different musical aspects than sometimes you do when you play, when you play a soloistically. So I would really encourage everyone to look at that, that list of things. And we can talk about it if you like, uh, just how to be a unique voice on your instrument. I know Alex loves Scott Pellegrom, and I do too. I do. He's one of the most creative, amazing players, unique, funny. You can hear his humor, unconventional technique sometimes, but just, I, I could listen to him solo forever. It's never just drum, drum nastics, as we say, or what, what have you. It's always got so much music in it. So hopefully we're all, you know, uh, we play because we love it and, you know, 
try to like I was saying before, man. You're 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 the people creating the music, so put your own vibes in there and your own twist into it. That's the best part of it for me, is to hear how every like if we all right now all decided to play the same groove, I'm sure it would sound very different, right? And that's that's the that's the great thing about it. It's the great thing about music. The individuals doing it. No, absolutely, and. I, to, to your point about practicing, I make sure, I mean, when I practice, I, I make it so that I, I, it sounds like I can't even play a lot of the time. I, I, I when I really, I, I spend a lot of time really practicing in that sense. And I, you sound bad. It's not supposed to sound good. It's ugly, <laughs> but yeah. that's how you get better. <laughs> and um, I'm just huge into a lot of that because that to me is real practice. Yeah, I, at least for me. Yeah, and then hopefully finding a way to use it musically. Sometimes I will practice something, and I'll and then I, it gradually ekes its way into my playing. You know, but some sometimes it takes a while, and then sometimes I'll be like, oh, there's that thing I practiced. <laughs> so and then here it comes out suddenly in a musical situation, which is good, which is always great. Does everybody playing gigs and playing for fun, playing professionally? I don't know if anybody wants to share that, but you can just thumbs up professional players. Cool. Yeah. Well, that that's good. That's good, man. I mean, I I can't remember the first time I got paid to play the drums. <clears throat> I got a hundred bucks to play with a band called Bob Grover and the Toon Twisters, a country western band. It really <laughs> made me realize that I couldn't understand the concept of getting paid to do something I loved so much. So hopefully, you all have that experience too. Really great. So you know, then if um, Alex, you can play the, unless anybody has any questions. I'll show you a. You know, uh, my teacher, Mel Lewis, the one that told me I was stupid for spinning my brush counter. -clock. He told you that? <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, 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 Mel but is, I, Mel is a luminary. I just yeah. can't imagine this. Wow. No, but he was, but he meant it with love. Like, he, oh, also, okay. berated a, he also berated a kid once for having um, a, a muffler in his bass drum and made, made, the, made, the, made a kid cry for that kind of thing. But <clears throat> do, are there any questions? Because I... Maybe I'll show you some sort of some interesting hand drum technique on the snare because Mel used to always say, you know, he goes, all oh, these drummers with all these damn drums, they can't even play one drum. <clears throat> when in fact playing uh, one drum, when you think about the history of the instrument, playing one drum and swinging, in the case of New Orleans history, on one drum, like and if any of us had to go on a gig with just a snare drum and like nail the groove, that would be incredibly challenging, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. So challenging. <laughs> You ever do that, Alex? Play on oh. limit yourself? Like, I mean, I used to do all the. Oh, yeah, that kind of stuff. And I've got the, with the finger control, I can do a lot of the ghost note patterns within each individual thing. So you get all. So, a hundred percent with you. Yeah, and then. I always think that that's and depending on the kind of music you're playing. If you're interested in it, all the, all hand drumming technique applied to the drums are, is very cool. Agreed. You know, like really cool. And if you've never, anybody has ever seen a Glenn Velez play, it doesn't. Oh he's, man, yeah. Tambourine. Like I mm -hmm. was at a PASIC conference one, and I was like, "Tambourine clinic, ha ha! This is stupid," because I was because I was stupid. <laughs> what you don't know, right? So I went there, jaw dropping to the floor with all 10 fingers engaged in playing a tambourine. It was the, one of the greatest solos that I've ever seen, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I, I had same similar experience. I didn't know anything about the guy. And the first time I saw him, he was playing frame drum. And I was like, hang on, how come he could make that thing sound <laughs> like an entire drum set? <laughs> right, I know. It's amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. Amazing. But let me show you this thing I got from a classical snare piece. There's a lot of contemporary snare. There's one called uh, the Noble Snare. It's a, there's a there's four books and they have a lot of composers have really thought about interesting ways to use the drum. I mean, not dissimilar to the way Scott Pellegrom might do it or and other players, very creative players who play, you know, of course, it's the rim, the shell, the lug, the bottom head, the snares, the throw off, like all parts of the drum, all areas of the drum and then using your hand. So here's like just a cool pattern. And I actually um, use this a lot because it's I think it's fun and different uh my flu my flips this is this is what it was from the from the book just that hit the drum click stick click rim click you can use this, you can put the shell in there if you want to but That's 
the really cool sounds, right? And it's just simple. And this, I love all the pitches that you can get from a click. And mostly we don't use that many of them. And then of course here you can see like a, what Alex was talking about, some of the, the fanning you can do with your fingers. I saw a Scott Pellegrum, or somebody did this, <laughs> playing over their fingers like that. That's Scott. So <laughs> That's somebody, Scott. Yeah, probably. But then you can, you know. And timbali technique. At old rumba drummers, dance drummers in the 30s. Finding those those sort of things, I I was um I can't remember it. I like to do this sometimes, just using the lugs. Like play across your lugs, you can get a good groove going. You can change the or you, the part of your stick that's scratching across them. Really cool sounds, you know. And then all the. Kind of using some pitch bending. I don't know, I feel like there's endless sound in one drum and that you should all go tonight and challenge yourself to play a great creative solo on one drum and have fun and use your yeah. elbows. Did you, anybody see that recent cool thing with uh, Benny Greb and Jojo Mayer playing the snare drum solo duet? And then they both, I mean, people think, oh, they invented putting their heel up on a drum. Drummers were doing this in the 30s, you know, like putting their feet up here and, you know, doing that stuff. But Benny and Jojo did it. It was super cool with mixed up with their, you know, their great snare chops. It was really great. If anyone hasn't seen that. But yeah, try to find some f fun and joy and creativity. I actually had my students at UArts in this improv class I was telling you about. They have, the t they, many of them have amazing chops. So I made everybody, I said, all right, <clears throat> and this is a jazz drummer named Billy Higgins he used to approach the drum set with a slightly different uh, attitude, at least when he talked about it. Instead of hitting things, he wanted to, it to be like an instrument that could play a love song. So I said, I made all the students write a, a ballad. I said, write a love song to your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your pet, your mother, your grandmother. Write a lo love song on the drums and play me something beautiful. And of course they were horrified, like beyond belief. They're like, what? <laughs> like I had no clue about what to do. I said, well, we can start with, maybe you'll use some mallets. Maybe you won't use your, your sticks. And they, they, you know, they did it. And it was, I, I think it was a light bulb went on, you know, about the potential in the instrument that doesn't always have to be loud and in your face, which is definitely a part of it, a fun and exciting part too, but finding other aspects because the instrument is so wildly diverse and as an acoustic instrument I mean the more power to play probably softer if we're using like the, our pinky nail and also louder with force and just the orchestration possibilities we have depending on well any even just one one drum it's quite extraordinary and unique so I man, everyone go do that play something great on one drum I mean uh, uh, something Scott and I both talked about was doing the freehand technique off of oh, any yeah. surface oh that's fun oh, you, oh yeah oh, wow that's fun <laughs> yeah, you can actually create a whole solo based on. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. even using just pitch shifting on a drum based off of that. So yeah, that's I completely agree. Uh, there's so much you can do with that. And if you, depending on how your kit is set up, <clears throat> too, with the you know. Oh yeah. Just whack hitting the stick, sit on, keep sitting here. But I, I don't know how well that's coming across my singular microphone, but <laughs> there's, I love all that. That's coming across great. Yeah, good. Yeah. And as long, <clears throat> now, you know, you really have to have, uh, you have to be very creative to look at your instrument like that, but it's not like, uh, for example, some people would criticize uh, avant-garde jazz players, um, particularly this one guy named Ornette Coleman, who had his son playing drums on his record because his son didn't know how to play drums. And that's the only way it could be deep and creative because the kid wasn't hung up by technique. Now, it's one way to think about it, <laughs> but I don't know. So this, I mean, it's not an excuse for your own personal joy if you're interested in this, but it does not an excuse like, well, I can't play a role, so I'm just gonna do this weird thing instead. <laughs> 
or like or pick up your snare drum and scream through it. Or do I've it. seen that one too, but like, hey, <laughs> like the friction friction roll. Oh yeah, yeah. Are, are always really fun too. I mean, and then there's you know you could do all the. Oh yeah. It's like all like the different textures you can get off the two stick. Oh yeah, I love that. Like yeah, just like the body stuff and all that, but incorporating that. But you would never have. Not everyone has a chance to like do that in a solo. Like you're not gonna go on a metal gig and do that. <laughs> I no, imagine. actually, I I uh, I I've I've done that before. Actually, um, believe it or not. I believe it. I have to come to one of your gigs now. Your next one and <laughs> check it. Absolutely, out. that would be awesome. Hey, you know, it's those, those gigs are always fun. Uh, just uh, good people, and a lot of them are very open minded too, which I really do like. Because, um, in fact, they're they're the most apt if you say you play, if you say you study jazz or you're into jazz, they're the most apt to be like awesome. That's much respect. Yeah, but so, Alex, one thing here. This is, I think, important for. Um, for for everybody, like, how do you develop? Um, I mean, uh, clearly, I'll I'll have my own opinion about it. But let's say you know you showed me a groove, or I showed you one, and then we both would sound really different playing that groove. How do we? Uh, how do you develop the best sense for the genre that you're playing to make it feel incredible or authentic? You know, like the, I forgot who it was. A metal drummer said, "Well, someone challenged me to humiliate myself, so here's me playing jazz." Oh, and that was Samus. It was really Parker. funny. It's like, man, such a. I saw that one could, too. How could such a great drummer sound so like not great? Because <laughs> it's mm. not just ding, ding, a ding. You know, I, it's, at least he admitted he was humiliating himself. No, but but it was. I thought that was kind of brave because it's it's like. Oh, I, completely. I, and the lesson for everyone, I was a, I had quite an epiphany when I was a, in college. I was making a lot of money playing with a cover band, a wedding band in the in the early '80s, and uh, you know, I I then I got into jazz and I had a horrible attitude. I was like, you know, screw Elvis and Willie Nelson stinks. And I was like, really an a-hole. You know, I was like, Miles Davis. I was so horrible. You know, because I didn't want to rehearse those tunes. And I was the only one in the band that could read music or whatever. So the guitar player said to me, Sherry, you know, your attitude is so horrible. And um, he wrote me this long letter. And the conclusion of the letter was, if you don't adjust your attitude, then someone should lock you in a closet and make you listen to Elvis and Willie Nelson. And, you know, et cetera. I mean, they could have fired me. You know, I was kind of... I, I was the, the greatest epiphany of my life was again, I'm getting paid to play the drums. Oh my God. And if I'm going to be a professional musician, no matter what I'm playing, I want to play it freaking awesome. Right? If it's, a, if it's a jingle for a hemorrhoid commercial or playing with the New York Pops or playing with my own band, I don't care what it is. If I say yes, I'm going with the greatest attitude and intent to play great. You know, and I, I don't know. I was so glad I didn't get fired from that. But do you ever have anything like that? Alex, going because you shift between jazz. I saw a nice clip of you at uh, were you playing at Birdland or something? Was yeah, something yeah, that was that was the Birdland. Yeah, oh, I, I, it's been it's been it's been a while, so I'm sorry if I offended you with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, so uh, for me, uh, the way that I always like to think is everything swings in its own way. Every music has its own swing. It's about and it's like a language. It's like a dialect. There's an there are inflections, accents, uh, certain ways of speaking, syllables, pronunciation. Music is, is a language, and that's how I, I try to see it. And I'm not even as versatile as some people are. I mean, you know, there are, especially in New York, there are people that just are so authentic in so many genres. Yeah, that's one of the, the hardest things, especially as, as world music, and we have more access to all of it like at least in, in the United States, and I don't know if it's a parallel with uh, rock, rock and roll, but, uh, you know, jazz, it's like, oh, this is, I can, I'll play this Latin beat, sure, we can do it, American jazz people. And Latin is <clears throat> such an insane term to me because it's like saying, play American. Like, what is, does even that mean? Like, <laughs> there's, you know, and I, uh, the pianist in my trio is a virtuosic Afro-Cuban pianist. Her name is Jackie Warren. And we, we, we started playing together seriously about seven years ago. And she calls it salsify everything, you know, and I'm doing the American jazz version of it. And she looked at me and she said, I don't trust you at all. And I was like, nor should you. Sure, I can play them. Here's my mambo and my songo. I had no problem. I know these rhythms, but they felt completely wrong to her. I was playing them with like a, a jazz vibe or, fr you know, and, and phrasing. And like Alex said, all the internal accents and the thing that make the groove pop in the right way. So 
Uh, the now, now she finally trusts me, but it took six years. It, I mean, it's hard to learn a dialect. You have to immerse yourself in the music. You have to yeah, listen, absolutely. Listen, 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 listen. And I don't care if it's disco, you know, which I happen to love because I grew up in the 70s. But Hey, yeah. yeah. Hey. <laughs> no, I mean, hey, that's, listen, I, I'd much rather listen to disco over crunk rap. So, like, <laughs> did, did you know that, uh, by the way, a tidbit is that the, um, one of the Bee Gees records is the first time, and I can't, I can't remember the drummer's name, is the first time that they actually looped a track. Mm -hmm. He played, he was gone from the session somehow, but he had played these four or eight measures that they love. So it was the first time that somebody just took that and just repeated it through the whole song. I, I, I watched it on a documentary a couple couple months ago. It's like, that's interesting. I, I uh, the Latin, uh, the way I heard the uh, very like, Stale Latin music set, uh, described was calling it Taco Bell. So Taco <laughs> Bell Latin music. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm very guilty of that. I, I mean, I, I'm I would never consider myself really good, but I I, I know the rhythms because I, sure. I work on them. But I'm not a Latin drummer by any stretch, nor am I a jazz drummer by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but but then, but then you get okay. Sure, I can play a samba, but then <clears throat> is it a samba like? Excuse me, <clears throat> like like the way that Steve Gadd would play it with Chick Corea, which is like a funk samba <laughs> with a lot of paradiddles, with the samba. There's so many different. We have to know a lot. Everyone <laughs> is what we're trying to say. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, it, it's also just like if you learn to speak a new language, and then you go over to somewhere that's been speaking this for decades or more. They're like, hmm, your accent's a little off, you know? Yeah. So it's the same kind of thing when you're getting into a different style of music. Your your accent is always going to be a little off until you've really immersed yourself into it. Yeah, but, you know, I still haven't found that. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but this one video I have of Steve Gadd a long time ago playing quarter note equals 60, just quarter notes in the hi-hat, bass drum on one and three, and snare drum on two and four. And somehow it felt amazing like i'm not clear amazing now we could all do that right this second we could all play that rhythm flawlessly i mean it's easy but he how did he make that feel so good at such a slow tempo with such a simple groove i know it has to be with flow and stroke and his slight internal dynamics and phrasing accents it was just that's that stuff to me is mysterious how even the, the simplest thing people can just elevate it so like like we're off the charts with groove and soul yeah, his too was just internal time. Gad's time is so perfectly impeccable that it's just the way he can shape, you know, kind of the trajectory of each stroke and how, where the note is exactly placed. It's just a it's magic. Now, Mark Dittiani, the he used to be the, the dean at the University of the Arts, now he's back in the drum department, told me that, and you might know this, a uh, big study where they took people like Steve Gad, and I, I'm going to say Steve Smith and maybe Vinnie Colaiuta, and several other drummers and put them in this computer programming to see how accurate their time was. And Mark just told me this like a week and a half ago. And he said not a single one stayed metronomically perfect without a click track. I mean, just playing on their own. Mm -hmm. I thought, I mean, but then it's not, not a license to rush and rush or drag ever for any of us, but that mm -hmm. I, we are human. <laughs> you, when you get excited, man, yeah. probably, you know, I don't know what your uh, philosophy is about that, Alex. Um, I think we're all human. <laughs> I'm guilty of it, and my time may have gotten better, but it's not perfect. And um, I try to play as on a click as I can when there's a you know the click tracks on. But um, sometimes the magic is in the push and pull. I mean, like you know, um, you know, Coltrane live at the Vanguard. Uh, oh, yeah. That like right. They speed up like crazy on some of those tracks, and they're still amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's an inter interesting that you know somehow. I don't know. Uh, it's like impressions. I think it's impressions live, and the song impressions literally go. It speeds up like twenty BPM, but it's still you would just don't care because it's so good. Yeah, a lot of a lot of I don't know about well, you know who was it? Um, Greg Bissonette was like saying something similar about charlie watts on some something with the stones on some live something or other he's like yeah it speeds up but who cares you know actually didn't notice that i don't <laughs> too much about the, with that band but all the traditional jazz records especially the live ones definitely <laughs> they all they all can like <laughs> go up or down a few clicks and 
the music is just so good no one really cares it didn't ruin the experience Uh, and, and you could definitely hear like especially because when you were when we were transcribing the stuff in college you go back and you'd hear them mess the forms up you'd hear like i remember lee conant said something like yeah if you play a mistake turn it into an idea Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes now when my, uh, especially during the pandemic, when a lot of the college students had to do everything on, on Zoom and use all these play along tracks, now when they try to play with a, a jazz record, they're like, this is so hard to play with because it keeps changing tempos. I was like, wow, okay. I don't know if, uh, you know, um, there's a famous story about Richard Davis and a bass player and Elvin Jones fighting outside the village vanguard and punching each other saying, you rush and you drag. You know, so when you think of iconic people in that music, it could happen to it could happen to the best of us, right? <laughs> oh yeah, whiplash. Yeah, uh, yeah that is a thing. <laughs> oh man, we got a couple more questions, and then I've got a couple for you guys as well, and we'll probably wrap up after that. Um, as much as I'd love to stay here and talk forever, because mm -hmm. the, the, these always end up in in that realm towards the end, where it's just feels like we could be here for hours and it's it's sometimes hard to wind it down yeah. uh, <laughs> um not that i want to uh, specifically it's just you know we all have places to be eventually <laughs> um anyway we have a question from eddie uh for sherry he says do you have any sunny pain stories just, just I, every time I see Sunny Payne, I find new things to steal <laughs> to put in my own repertoire. One of the most exciting, you know, exciting. He's a virtuosic player of his day. Like really drove any big band he sat in like caught fire. I don't, you know, certainly I, I'm not old enough to have hung out with Sunny Payne, but <laughs> but he was amazing, and I'm I'm so grateful for all the YouTube videos that are out now. Sunny Payne and Papa Joe Jones too, two of my favorites. Definitely. Yeah, um, question for both of you um, is, I'd, I'd like to hear maybe a record or two, something that has inspired you recently, just something that you've been playing on repeat, or maybe it's not even music related, but something that, that's got your interest lately that's translating over to your creativity, whether it's like a new song or going back to an old thing or something like that. That's a that's a good question. Go ahead, Alex. Got anything off the top of your head? Yeah, um, the, a record by a drummer who has a good name for drums. His name is Pete Drummond, and the record is called Light Beyond Sleep, and it's a a fusion record from Australia. And um, I'll put it this way: there's a reason Pete is the first call for Virgil Donati when Virgil can't make a gig, and. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear it on this record. Pete is uh, Pete is extraordinary, and so I I can just listen to Pete's playing nonstop because he his he is so so good, and uh, just a wonderful human being too. So there's also that. Um, <laughs> and it, that's really important too to survive in the music business. Absolutely. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> uh, I love uh, Jeff Hamilton, any of his trio recordings. He's one of the best drum drummers I know, one of the greatest living brush players of all time. And he was a teacher of mine, too, when I was much younger. And Jeff, especially with the Ray Brown trio, that's my one of my ultimate happy places when I'm not listening to disco. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> those Jeff Hamilton, Ray Brown records are so good. <laughs> they are yeah. so good. But, and, but Jeff is, you know, ex just he's extremely explosive yeah he plays with incredible dynamics and patience he just he can just groove with a like simplest most you know killing brush pattern and just groove and and just and then you see if you feel the energy amping up and how he does it in such a perfect subtle way he just has patience to let the music just like explode by itself it's 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 so musical yeah i love his playing Mm -hmm. Always, yeah, he's great. Yeah, no, he's Jeff's. Jeff's amazing. It's just phenomenal. Um, that's all. Those are those uh, records. Oh, and one more, record. one more, man. There's a drummer named Jerry Gibbs whose father was an incredible, famous vibes player named Terry Gibbs. And in the 50s and 60s, they had a thing called the Dream Band. 
So Terry's almost, uh, he's pushing 100, I think. No, maybe he's 94. I, he just had a huge birthday. And so Jerry Gibbs, who's a, a great drummer during the pandemic, drove all over the United States. And his trio is called a Thrasher Trio. And this is his dream band. So, and it was actually Chick Corea's last recording. So it's all Terry Gibbs songs. The dad is called Songs, for, uh, songs From My Father. And there's four different trios. One with um, Chick Corea and uh, one with... Um, Patrice Russian and one with Kenny Barron and one with Jeff Keezer. There's those other, I forget who all, Buster Williams is on bass. I forget all the, and Ron, Ron Carter is one of the bass players. But I put on this record and I'm like, oh my God, the arrangements are incredibly great. And, you know, all, all trio, completely different, but, you know, driven by Jerry. He's a great drummer, very creative. All <clears> different <throat> styles, all different to like funk. There's all, all different styles of music on these. It's a double CD. It's great. Also got a question again from Eddie on the on the disco side of things. He uh -huh. wants to know uh, if you've got a favorite disco record. Oh, I do love the Bee Gees. <laughs> <laughs> I say with pride, but you no, know, actually, I when I'm when I'm home and decide, I I do listen to a lot of Earth, Wind, and Fire. I love that band too. Mm -hmm. And Chicago and the Doobie Brothers. I like those bands. Yeah, Eddie's fist pumping over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. got to see, you know, got to see them all live, you know, many times. So that's always added bonus. <laughs> mm -hmm. Those, uh, all of those are so good. Yeah. So good. And uh, especially because the uh, old drummer from before Tops, Drew, uh, is a friend of mine. I got, a, you know, got really exposed to a lot of just like I used to listen to that stuff all the time. So, you know, Aretha, the Four Tops, the Temptation, the Temptation, sorry, um, you know, Funk Brothers, just stuff from Spider Turner, Melvin Davis, you know, just a lot of this beautiful stuff. So I'm agree with you. Stuff's, what was that? What wasn't there a move? Wasn't it called, called the Wrecking Crew? I just watched it about yeah. The, oh yeah, the, the yeah. hit makers from the you know Motown stuff and all that. Standing in the shadows of the Motown. Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really great. Yeah, I, I saw something about that when it was in the works as well. And it was such a cool project like that they were putting together. I, I remember seeing it on a site called Drum Channel like years ago. Yeah. That was really cool. Because yeah. they had Hal Blaine on, on their show talking about it. Yeah, cool. Yeah. That was a um, nice question. Yeah. Um, I got another one for you guys, which is a, a little bit different, but kind of sort of going off of how the last couple of years have been for a lot of people. Um, I feel like a lot of people have been dealing with burnout in some way or another. And I'm curious if you two have ever had to deal with that in your creativity or your careers. And is there something that you've done that's helped you like bounce back in a, in a time where you're feeling less enthusiastic about what you've been doing. You want, you want to go first, Alex? <laughs> <sighs> um, well, writing a book helped. I'll put it that way. Uh, I having, uh, I, there was a time period where I really didn't even know I wanted to do this still. So I gave me put a goal for myself. I wanted to work through two of the hardest drum books ever written. And uh, when I was in my mid twenties, I decided I was going to finish the Thomas Lang book and the Marco Miniman book, all the way to the end. Not mm -hmm. finish them. And then I wrote mine. So that was my goal: was to work on those that prevented burnout. Because I just kind of was like, "All right, I'm going to drive myself nuts working on these books." But but you love it, right? You, mm -hmm. you you love you were really passionate about it. Right. I would, I, yeah, I mean, I, I became passionate about it. I mean, it was really hard and it was just, uh, it's, it, it's not something I really recommend for people if, if you're not going, it's, it's like a lifestyle you live to <laughs> fix it, the work on books like that. And then like push it further than that. it's, it's really, if, if you're into it, you're into it. And if not skip it. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm guessing you probably had a couple of days where you're like, what am I doing to myself right now? <laughs> I, I think I had about two nervous breakdowns <laughs> in the process of that. It was bad, but um, I guess yeah. I, became, I got yeah. better in the process. So, Yeah, I've, I've worked on some of Marco's stuff also, and I've got a couple of books by Mike Manzini, and they're all just like, this is insane. <laughs> wow. Well, I... Um... 
Well, like I said, I've been running my own band for almost 30 years, and we have we literally have toured all over the world. I mean, great. That's one of the best parts of being a professional musician and playing festivals everywhere. And the business aspect is the thing that makes me want to quit. And it, at least at least twice a year, I'm like, I hate music, and I'm I'm quitting because <laughs> I, I never do. But I I forget all the the reason that I love my instrument and the music because once you hit the stage, none of that stuff matters. But sometimes in between, the business part is really infuriating on many levels, you know, and frustrating. So I, I really like like you said, Alex, for different reason. Like, do I want to do this anymore? This stinks. <laughs> but then. During the pandem pandemic, though, when I mean, I, it was horrible that all these tours and things got canceled. But then I was just, just saying earlier that I felt like, my God, I had all this time to practice. I felt like I was in college. I felt so inspired and happy <laughs> until the gigs didn't come back. <laughs> and I was like, damn it. But yeah, yeah, I think it's just always remembering the, the love you have for, for music and the instruments. And you're, you know, I don't know. That's what keeps me rolling. Yeah. Cool. And, uh, one last one for you too is um do you have like any gigs coming up or anything you want to plug on either of your sites because we'd love to come out and and see you guys if you've got any anything coming up in the area well uh i my i just finished four nights at jazz at lincoln center with my big band but i wish i, wish I wish we'd have done this last alex came to hang out for for a minute there and uh mm -hmm. we're celebrating a brand new cd it's called the diva jazz orchestra swings broadway there's nice. some sample tracks on divajazz.com. You can check it out if you like. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can get any links you want also sent out to, like we're going to send out another email after all this with a, a little survey and just any extra links you guys want to add to that, feel free. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I've got a, a big metal tour coming up in May and June, so I'll be, through, I think, in a couple days in Philly, maybe. So I'll certainly keep everybody updated because that'll be a fun time. Do you have any details on the tour or is it um, kind of under wraps? No, it's currently, it's a, it's suffocation, atheist, contrarian and surreption coming through. So I love all the bands on that bill. So it's just a lot of fun to be like listening to bands that I've, I've loved since I was a kid. Nice. Yeah. Where is that going to, where is that? I'm not exactly sure where it's going to be. I will look it up and absolutely invite everybody here because it should be a really fun time. And those all those bands are killer. I can't wait to see Atheist live because I, I like I grew up on on suffocation and Atheist, so you know it's amazing for me to see them. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, gigs will start picking back up for everyone. It's, it's, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. All the all the bookers are now still two years behind trying to book everything they canceled in 2020. Right. You know, yeah. To keep it fair for everyone, so it's going to take a minute to get back to uh, mm -hmm. normal. Yeah, we're we're seeing so many big shows. I know in in the Philly area too. Like all of the big things that were supposed to happen over the last couple of years are suddenly like popping up, and there's just suddenly so much stuff to yeah. be on the lookout for. It's crazy. Have has anyone seen? Have you guys all seen Stomp or parts yeah. of Stomp? I haven't. It's wildly creative for anything to do with anything percussive that you can possibly make sound and rhythm on highly 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 rec it was just at the kimmel center mm -hmm. one december just really recommended so much just go to youtube and watch some of it yeah. eddie's giving a thumbs up on that too yeah it's great yeah well cool um if there aren't any other questions we'll move towards wrapping things up um does anyone else have anything to say um and in the in the meantime, I just want to remind you guys that we're all super appreciative of you tuning in and still being here. We've had concurrent numbers like through from the beginning to the end, which is amazing. And like, we're really appreciative of all the support because Philly Drum Project is, like I said, a nonprofit and everything is made possible by you guys, everyone who comes out and supports, everyone who donates to us, whether you're donating like financially or just being here and viewing and, you know, spreading the word, all of that helps us out. And it's amazing. We've got a, like our entire program is run democratically. We've got a steering committee that runs everything. I am one of the two co-chairs. Eddie is the other one. We've got a bunch of our steering committee members here. We've got Amy, Brendan, um, a 
not sure who else is in the room right now. Casey is here as well. Matt's here. Yeah, and we've got a bunch of other guys as well that are not currently here. But yeah, like we're always looking for people to help out as well. So if you're interested in helping out in any way at all, please just reach out to us at phillydrumproject.gmail.com or go to our website, phillydrumproject.org and just shoot us a message or become a member. Membership is currently free and we can always use any input that you have. Cool, well, looks like we don't have any other questions, but we got a lot of thank yous coming in and I wanna extend a big thank you to both Alex and Sherry as well for thank coming you for on. Us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, it's been amazing. This past couple of hours just kind of flew by mm -hmm. and I'd love to get, have you guys back at some point as well. Oh, um, absolutely. In person, hopefully as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think we're moving towards that. Um, we've seen a lot of things ease up in Philly and I would expect that we'll at least be back outdoors soon. So I'm excited about that as well. But anyway, thank you all for coming. And big shout out to Alex and Sherry for being here and shout out to everyone else for being here as well. Uh, and have a great night, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you, you for coming, everyone. <laughs>